G'day Nina, how are you? Good, thanks Andrew, how are you? Oh, busy week. Always hey, a good week. Hey. You're looking very blue today. <laughs> yeah, well, we don't have a blue screen behind us, so I thought I'd be blue today. Yeah. <laughs> We're, interesting week in football. Oh, you've lost me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think over the next few weeks, I think we should from time to time just reflect on this new underlying condition of burnout that's being described and we're seeing very high profile people just suddenly go i can't take this anymore from the western australian yeah, Premier, yeah, that um, was shocking. to you know a number of football coaches have just stepped aside and it was almost when one person put their hand up the rest goes oh, i've just had enough yeah, i just can't a light bulb moment and i guess when we talk about psychological hazards it's worth understanding that we, we talk about psychological hazards for subordinates we forget that leaders wear enormous psychological hazards yeah. around them. And I guess um, not next week because the new secure jobs all the changes are, coming are all coming finally. out. So we're going to spend quite a bit of time next week and we'll probably, I think, put out a bit of a paper that says what you need to know. That would be, I'm just dropping that on there and that. But um, over the next few weeks, I want to concentrate on the pressures that are on leaders as well and the impact on leaders of psychological hazards because the legislation doesn't, contemplate the pressures on leaders it contemplates the pressures leaders put on others yes um, but so what does that mean for leaders and what protections do organizations need to have in place for their leadership group to ensure that those hazards which are still litigable okay so yeah. you know a ceo can still bring a cause of action can still complain but how do we actually make sure we've got the right um, valves to let off pressure how do we know that someone is performing at a level which is reasonable given the demands that are on them? They're all governance issues which are really important issues that need to be discussed. Yep. And just nobody seems to be interested. And as a leader yeah. in a business, I feel them every day. But it's just crazy <clears throat> that they don't because those people, if they're not in the best state, then they're not going to be able to you know, provide the best care to the people underneath them. And they're, gonna, hand and they're, gonna, and they're gonna put the pressures down, which yeah. create the problems that are contemplated by new yeah. legislation. Anyway, so over the There's next a sneak peek of a sneak peek in the next few weeks, and probably one of those will be while I'm in Singapore. So I'll look a very relaxed leader. <laughs> Perhaps we can jump now into the CFMEU and Fair Work Ombudsman case, which is the um, right of entry case. Yeah. Um, this has made one in a long line of many. Really. Yeah, and look, this this found its way right through to the federal court, and there was a whole lot of arguments around whether homophobic slurs were used, which is which on a construction site was a, was overcooked. This yes. was just really bad behaviour by union organisers, failed to provide a permit when requested. Yeah, and then, provide notice of attending. And then did stuff that was unsafe and threatening. Yeah, they, I think, tried to intimidate the supervisor when he asked and then just bypassed him and just went onto the site anyway. Yeah, and stood in front of a heavy vehicle. That yeah, and stopped it. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so uh, you'll be not surprised to learn that the actions of the union organised in that case were unlawful. But I think Nina and I, when we talked about this, really wanted to stop and think for a while and say, well, what do you know if you're on a site that has union officials or could have union officials attend? And our answer is please have a tick list. Yeah. <laughs> please it's pretty simple. know what you've got to do. You must ask for the provision of a permit. There are times where there is a risk to safety where a union official can come on looking after a particular person because they have to give you 24 at least 24 hours notice unless there's a pressing last minute reason so that should be the first step yeah and then as soon as they come give ask them to give you a copy of the permit and make sure it's valid not expired there's that there's many cases about that as well it's crazy and look after that understand your own obligations about acting reasonably towards them and not deliberately interfering in the purpose of the notice of entry but fundamentally ensuring that their actions on site are safe and they're aware of their safety obligations on site. Yeah, and okay. within the scope of the limits of their powers. So they can't interrupt employees' work to go and talk to them and things like that. There's a proper time and place that they're allowed to carry out their duties as well. So have a think about it. Try and put together your tick list and go, all right, well, I know what to do. But I think that for us, we commonly get a call when it's too late. We get the call after the union officials have left, they've gone out into the production area and are chatting to people yeah. on the basis of collecting evidence when they're meant to be working. Um, the delegates walked off the job to go and have a chat to the union official. Everyone's going, well, what do we do? What do we do? And I say, well, the 
the genie's out of the bottle, I'm afraid. <laughs> it's a bit late at that stage. So please have a process, but the most important part about it is have a respectful practice. So don't do this as a combative exercise. No. Do this as a compliance and business way, yep. and then you'll find you build respect from the union officials around that idea. Probably the next issue is Victorian government and the gig economy, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah, it is. There we go. That's gone yeah. well. And and now the federal government where it's come. So you'll know the Victorian government's already started to work on the gig economy and has looked at dealing with them and providing some underlying protections. But what the federal government have said is, and I, this is where we're going rather than where we're at sort of conversation, which is there are a whole lot of people who are in unfair contracts, whether that's a gig worker, whether that's a contractor. Yeah. The breakdown of the employment relationship as the primary method of engagement and yeah. it has started the breakdown has meant that there are some behaviours which are genuinely unfair and they're commonly directed towards more mar marginal and vulnerable people in the community who are willing to take $10 an hour and use their own car. Yeah, exactly. So all the stuff that we were talking about, minimum standards, the federal government um, and DWA have said, look, this is something that's coming, that they're going to introduce these minimum standards for gig working, um, the gig working economy, but now they're looking further at introducing and capturing all independent contractor relationships. Yeah, and look, the MBA and other organisations say no. Look, it's only really to do with food delivery services. Yeah. And the gig economy is not that, by the way. And and one of the difficulties that all of us are having is there is now a, definitely a third method of engagement. We think it's got to do with Uber drivers and food delivery. It hasn't. There are more collaborative groups of people going for work in loose affiliations, which are not contracting, which is pure gig, yeah. which is how it's done in Asia. Mm -hmm. That's coming to Australia. It's been slow to take off because Australia has two laws. You're either an employee or you're a contractor. So the federal government legislation following on from where Victoria is, is starting to say, look, there is this middle ground, but there's an easier way to deal with it rather than characterising someone as one, two or three. We'll just say, if you're not an employee, these are minimum conditions. Yeah. And I think it's going to be really interesting because they haven't yet decided if it is going to cover independent contractors. Our prediction is, look, it's going to, because with many industries, particularly construction, there is this idea that larger corporations will impose set terms and conditions and say, you take it or leave it. If you don't agree, then we're never going to use you on any other side. And we've had so many clients come to us and say, look, we don't know how to get out of this. We're really struggling with this. Well, they're going to create a whole new unfair contracts regime where they can bring these types of claims, claims um, at a cheaper, more efficient way. Yeah. And look, by changing the nature of the jurisdictional powers of the Fair Work Commission, if you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound, is my yeah. view. When, once they decide to do that, they're going to broaden its remit to deal with the vice that exists out there. And the vice that exists out there is it doesn't really matter whether you're a contractor or a gig person. The issue is, are you being treated fairly? fairly? Yeah. And so once you look at one, you've got to look at the other. Yeah. So that's where we think. We just thought we'd raise it because it's coming. As with a lot of the new Labor government stuff, the communication comes well before the legislation. Yeah. So the detail is not obvious at the moment, but it, that's where we think it's going to come. So let's jump to a case... Look, we've chosen a really interesting case. I think it's just, it's a funny case. Um, and the <laughs> applicant is very funny. This is Anders. Yeah, This is the lawyer who, who keeps claiming discrimination in every jurisdiction. Yeah. Time. Very offended that people keep knocking him back. Yeah, because he doesn't get the job. He applies for jobs at very small firms and gets knocked back. And I think even just nine days ago, he lost another case to that do with sex AAT discrimination. Camp, yeah. Yeah, and one of the claims was, oh, my interviews were too attractive and they thought I was a woman because of my name and they didn't pick me when they found out I was a guy. There was no substance to any of it. Like, <laughs> and I would recommend that you read the case because they're hilarious, the kind of claims this guy makes. But this one... <laughs> just, just careful, we don't need another claim. <laughs> <laughs> but this one um, was about him applying to this law firm and they said, look, can you give us your passport, um, copy of your passport and your citizenship details? And he said, that's racial discrimination because I was born in India and you're using that as a basis to not hire me. He also said that the fact that there was an optional 
um, part in the application form to fill in his birth date was age discrimination. And the court said, look, that clearly is not true. The birth date is just for information, like, like every employee collects that information by employees. And it was necessary to, con to collect the passport information because you needed to check whether he had a right to work in Australia. So absolutely no basis. Can I say Nina chose this case? No, you <laughs> can't say that. But I think the important thing that for our clients, because hopefully you never come across one of those people, is there are these bad seeds in the world where they repeatedly How go after. How much damage are you going to do to my liability insurance? <laughs> where, where they do, repeatedly will go after and just file claims for the sake of it. And the best way to protect yourself in these situations is just to ensure that you act fairly and respectfully during the recruitment phase. You know, be careful with the language in the interviews, no comments like, oh, you know, what are your plans in the future? You know, five, 10 years, what are you thinking? Any babies, nothing like that. No comments about someone's age and make sure you've got valid objective reasons for choosing someone and then you'll be fine. Yeah, it's Nina's choice. It okay, next, choice. <laughs> next case. Next case. liar. <laughs> All right. I definitely chose this case. Yeah. I chose this case for really, this was somebody who had been suspected corrupt conduct. There had been investigations undertaken and the, the complaint in this process sought some way into the litigious process to actually gain anonymity and so the name should be suppressed. <clears throat> Why would I tell you this case? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is it's very hard to suppress a name and there are guidelines that exist in all places, which is around the protection of a person. Mm -hmm. It's not around um, prejudicial comments being made about them. It's not about people knowing that they did bad behaviour. It's none of those things. It's where the publication of the name places that particular person at risk or puts justice at risk by the, the nomination of the name. So, it's, it's, so the case is unspectacular. But when I rose, raised this with Nina, I said, look, I, I want Put this case out there and there's a reason i want to put it out is most people forget that once a decision is made it will be published yeah and sorry andrew i just want to interrupt just to make it very even emphasize this that in this case when she sought to get her name withdrawn the other side actually consented to that but despite that the court still said no and that's what it's a high threshold yeah and look you. and the court's interest is in justice being seen to be done so I know it sounds like a sort of old phrase which doesn't have a lot of meaning, but actually it's our whole system. Our whole system is about saying this person brought this claim and was successful because or was unsuccessful because. So there is a genuine learning, but it also makes litigators responsible for their actions when they bring claims. Yeah. The reason I brought it was not so much that, but when I look at a, a client's name and I Google them, what I find out first is latest developments, but commonly any litigation process will pop up. Pop up. Google, yeah. So Nina was talking about Oracle and Richardson, yeah. which is a famous sexual harassment case. And, and it's although, a huge company. Yeah. And whenever Nina thinks about Oracle. I can't think of anything but Richardson. That's true because we're lawyers and that's a, yeah. that's a leading case. But my point about it is really be careful what you, what you ask for. In litigation, particularly where you're respondent litigation in sexual harassment, psychological hazard claims, hostile workforce claims, <clears throat> many of those claims go away quite cheaply. So the actual cost of litigation is very small, but the naming of it and the reputational damage is massive because of the way social media now aggregates anything about a particular person's name. So if you put in a footballer's name, you'll find out their best last game, but then you'll find out the affair they had, the time they were drunk in Bali. Mm. Everything will be listed about that person because it catches on to the algorithm in their name. And the same is true for you as employers. And so, and there's no anonymity for employers ever. So the, yeah. the, sh the short answer is the only way to prevent yourself from that type of reputational damage, which is increasing at an exponential rate, okay? Businesses are being written off because of reputation damage, large businesses are, are, are losing. And, and well, PwC. Yeah, well, look at, just have a look at what's happened to PwC. Yeah. There will be a whole lot of people who walk away from them as a provider because of what they did. Okay. So, and every time you look up PwC in Australia for the next 10 years, you'll see their behaviour towards government. 
So the reputational harm way exceeds the wrongdoing that has actually occurred. And across the world as well, it's made world news. So I, I think, yeah. yeah. So can I just, we put it here just so we can have the second discussion and also to say, when people do bring bad claims, don't be scared of them. Um, they won't they won't be able to get away from their wrongdoing in the process either. So don't think, God, we've got to get rid of this to get damage our reputation. If it is a spurious claim, go hard. Mm. All right. I think that we jump on now to our major theme, don't we? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. this, is, this is, so we're talking about being honest about who's doing stuff. This is definitely my idea. Okay. Um, one of the things over the last five years is Nina and I tracked trends in the way safety prosecutions and safety regulators and courts are behaving and legislators because when we give you advice we've got to tell you what is the risk now where is it going to where is it going to land and so you've heard us say three or four times maybe 400 times if it's me that regulators are laying more complex higher charges against individuals mm -hmm. and organizations courts have adjusted up to giving higher sentences and not fearful of giving custodial sentence, that is jail time. Yep. And we're seeing legislators to, tr to try and wind back the wrongs that are occurring, creating much more onerous legislation with positive duties, prohibition, higher fines and higher sentences. So where are we going in the world at the moment? We're seeing this escalation in complexity, cost and risk for, yep. towards business owners and leaders within business. And when I look back on the cases over the last three or four years, the thing that I, I noticed when I look back and raise it with Nina is, <clears throat> when you look at cases five or six years ago, there was some very big incidents that occurred in mining things causing death. And we saw relatively complex um, prosecutions occurring. But we're seeing that across the board now, not just in mainstream tele, you know, television no, events. Where, even with small businesses. Yeah, well. and I think what we're seeing now is the regulators coming in and saying, look, you've got a nice documentary system there. You've got a nice induction system. You know, you're filling out swims, you're doing everything, but people are dying and they're dying because the supervisors are not enforcing the rules that exist or are absent when risk is around. And therefore, the supervisor in the organisation is liable because the supervisor's problem failure is the organisation's failure. But there is a real focus on supervisors and particularly in supervisors involved in change, their failure to appropriately consult and manage. And yep. so what I said, Nina, is look, am I right about this trend? If I am, and if I'm not, because I'm just like that. <laughs> <laughs> and we had AI constructions, which is the most recent case yeah. of it. Am I right about the way it's going? Yeah, look, there is definitely a, a subtle trend, I'd say, that there is focus on supervisors and the courts keep bringing it up, keep saying, oh, there's a lack of supervision. And I think a lot of people haven't picked it up on it because they don't really harp on about it as much. But you can see just when I looked at the last the, uh, cases this year, we yeah. found like at least six, seven different types of cases where supervision was a key consideration by the courts as to how far um, the employee had fallen from the standard of duty. Yeah. Um, and in A1, it was, you know, one of those cases where two workers were trying to remove loading skates from a condenser, which had been loaded into a container, and unfortunately it fell off the jack and fell onto them, and one of them... Um, died and one of them was seriously injured and the key like pretty much out of everything else they focus on the fact that if there had been a supervisor there actively supervising it would have significantly reduced the risk because it could have been seen like you know it was happening and called out to them but also another thing that people often forget about is supervisors are there on the front line and they're the ones who need to know how qualified how experienced how skilled and employees are and know to put them in roles which they can actually do and in this case that didn't happen I mean, look it's a bit like a footy coach isn't it yeah you don't you don't put a rover to full forward but it's such a great point that Nina makes which is you know that when you look at what a safety system is it has six elements is there a plan what are the processes behind it what is the education based on competence what is the super supervisor's knowledge of the plan the mm -hmm. process and the skills of the people that they're operating with 
how does that supervisor monitor and report back against the plan? So these six elements. But the bottom three all relate to the supervisor. Yeah. But the critical part is if I'm handing out a piece of work in the business and I go to hand out safety work to Matt, who does industrial relations, he's, he's not going to have the skills that Nina has. And yet on a work site, it's very common to say, hey, you two can do this yeah. without any consideration of are they qualified to do it? Are they capable of doing it? Have they had recent experience yeah. in doing it? You see, the supervisor skill has so many different layers of calibration and they all come back to the safety system of number three. Uh, has the person got the skills and capability to do the job that is requested? And then there is just the visual part. Is it safe? And the supervisor is the eyes of the business. Yeah. And then you go down to saying, well, is the business system working, the monitoring process? Again, the only person who gives that evidence is a, it's not the OHS manager. No. It's, it's the operational the person late. who's doing yeah. it. So there's a couple of other cases you might want to just have a brief mention just to hone in on it. Yeah, so um, there were a bunch of cases, and these are all very significant penalties. They range from 180000 to 420000 um, But they all focused, so there was a case against Metro Crane and BSA Limited, who all focused on the fact that all of these incidents and fatalities, so one of them involved um, an electrocution shock, one of them involved working at heights, so he fell through a sky light, is that what they're called? Yeah. Um, they all had perfect processes, perfect induction procedures. And, you know, if you were to go through a tech checklist, yes, they've clearly gone and through And all the everything. mechanical guards. So yeah. they had all the machinery, they had yeah. all the, the PPE, so everything. everything. was perfect. But the only thing is they had no active supervision and no one who would come around and make sure people were actually using the controls they had learnt about. So there was no harnesses for the falling at heights and there was no locking out and tagging out um, live wires, things like that. And it just goes to show that the reaction to, if you have an incident, to just spend a lot of money on an expensive consultant and to rehaul everything into the most perfect system is probably not the best thing. Well, in fact, it's the biggest risk, isn't it? Yeah. Because it's not in the language of the people who are there therefore it won't be used. Secondly, as far as reasonably practicability goes, when the WorkSafe come in after the next incident, they look at what the policies and procedures. Say, so this is what you say. Remember, you this is do. best practice, not mm -hmm. reasonably practical. And they mm -hmm. say, well, you fell short of that, therefore you're liable. And the court will go, yes, you are. So, and again, this is something that's very common that Nina and I come when someone's had an incident or they're worried about where they are, rather than dig deep internally yeah. and bring someone in to consult internally and grow yeah. bit by bit by bit, they come in and they just shove in a new set of rules mm. and wonder why it makes no difference, no change. And then they do have an incident and the regulator just prosecutes them because it couldn't be easier. Yeah, because you've got to remember, it's not policies and procedures that build competency. It's the practice and you know the relationship with the supervisors where they're reinforcing the behaviour, saying, no, that's wrong, this is how you do it, and teaching them or reinforcing good behaviour. It's that repeat repetitiveness that actually builds the competencies in, in your own. Like our own learning. You know, like yeah. when you learn language, it's knowing what a vowel is, knowing what a consonant is, you learn to be able to pronounce the consonant at the end yeah. of the word so it's understandable. That's something that re requires incredible repetition and so does safety yeah. safety is a practice mm -hmm. yes it's a, a science but it is a practice that makes a place safe anyway look that's just a favorite thing yeah. for you and i to get going on let's let's get <laughs> on to the case studies today so chelsea was an engineer at strut structures ss was a key provider of structural steel and aluminium for commercial construction in the commercial building market chelsea provided engineering advisory work to clients and internally for ss Creighton was the site supervisor for SS at the Craig Event site where 12 warehouses were being built by big shed builders. Super creative, Andrew. I know, I know. <laughs> it was early this morning. Chelsea <laughs> was young, inexperienced, and had been on the end of some poor behaviour by workers on BSB. She had suffered wolf whistles and sexualised commentary from workers on site. Creighton had spoken to her only a few weeks before when he had observed her crying. She had said she was not to use it, but oh, not used to it, but knew she had to toughen up. Creighton spoke to the BSB site supervisor and said it had to stop. That supervisor, Tom, said he was sorry and undertook to speak to his crew. 
Tom did as promised, they laughed at him and walked away. On the 24th of May, Chelsea had been called to site to look at the weight bearing capacity and tensile strength of a roof strut, where Tom had observed some odd markings on the paint on the strut. Chelsea went to the site foreman's hut to sign the swim and was met by Jono, a welder employed by BSB, who smiled when she entered and said, I'm happy to carry you up, Chelsea. You can sit on my shoulders. He smiled and approached her, spooked her. She quickly signed the swims, went outside on the roof, got in the lift and went straight to the roof. Jono accompanied her. He kept talking to her in a jovial but somewhat suggestive way. She felt very unsafe. Contrary to a swim, she did not attach a harness despite the roof cladding being incomplete. Where there were gaps, there was railing. As she examined the roof strut through a gap in the roof with Creighton, Jono stood behind, pointing at her behind to fellow workers and making offensive gestures simulating sex. Creighton saw it and told him to leave, but it was too late. Chelsea had seen it all, both Jono and the co-workers laughing. Her mind just closed down. She got up to leave when Creighton spoke and stepped straight into the gap, pulling 11 metres onto a concrete floor. All right, oh so the God. questions. Pretty. Uh, can I just say, I'm not that, that creative. I just want you to understand. This is after 35 years of this. Bits and pieces of all of these stories have come from you from various sites. So I don't want you to think this is something novel or new. That type of behaviour is fairly constant on building sites. Mm -hmm. um, and as women engineers and tradespeople and stuff emerge on site, they are regularly experiencing. And my son, who works in the construction industry, reminds me of that and tells me of his reaction and difficulty in getting change from those behaviours. But anyway, so that's why it's in there today. Is BSB, that's the building business, liable under safety law? And if so, for what? Yeah, I would say so. Because, um, so BSB is the other entity. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they didn't make it a safe workplace for other people and they had management control of the site. So section 26. And 20, yeah, and 23. 23, yeah, for yeah. other people, yep. Yeah. Okay, that's in Victoria and similar provisions. So, not only did that, they they were seized with knowledge because Tom is their connecting issue, their, their connection. Yep. They are seized with issues of to the acute nature of the effect of having it. And he did something, but not enough. And therefore, because reckless endangerment deals with a person, mm -hmm. not an employer, they could well be liable for that. Could they have the knowledge just from her reaction to the other employees? Like no, it's code. The reaction is the knowledge that Tom got from Creighton. Once Tom was seized with that, the organisation was seized with it. Oh, no, no, I agree with that. But if other employees who are subjecting to her to behaviour know that she's uncomfortable by them, is that also imputed knowledge? Yeah, it is. So yeah. that would capture heaps of people. Yeah. Uh, is SS liable under safety law? And if so, what for? Well, look, unquestionably exactly the same. Yeah. So definitely primary, primary duty breach. So 21, 22. Reckless endangerment. And reckless endangerment. And I'm afraid for Creighton, he's failed to actually yes, say, look, don't come. More yeah. questions. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. We'll come back to that. If Reagan was the owner and operation, operations manager of SS and Creighton had told him of the behaviours towards Chelsea and the impact upon it, could he be liable under safety law and what for? If she died, yeah. Reagan is lining up for industrial manslaughter. Yeah. And Reagan's lining up for, for a couple of reasons, and that is he's in an industry where this is a notorious fact. He's been told of someone who's having an acute reaction to it. Yeah. He's been told it is ongoing, and he failed to make any further inquiry to determine she was safe. Yeah, or tell them to, you know, move her to a different side or something. Yeah. I think Section the like, 144 is... Yeah, I think, yeah, the, li the likelihood of his prosecution for industrial manslaughter in this case is low yeah. to, on the basis of the evidence. A little bit more evidence, a little bit more knowledge and other complaints being made much higher. Yep. Okay, let's go to the next question. Could Tom and Creighton be liable under safety law? Yes, Tom under the Section 25 obligations to another person. Yes, but also the fact that I still say reckless endangerment. Oh, yeah, no, he's there yeah. up there. He, he knew about it and although he got them to stop, he clearly knew that they weren't taking it seriously because they laughed and walked away and he didn't do anything further. Yeah, and look, Jono, despite him being an idiot, um, I think his likelihood is more of a, a Section 25 25. breach, so a lower level breach. If Chelsea survived, what would the cause of action be? Well, she'd have multiple with it. Besides the common law workers' compensation yeah. side, she'd certainly have the sexual harassment claims and the hostile workforce. She could group. ask them to bring a safety prosecution yeah. as well. So there's unlimited claims that Chelsea would have, but falling 11 metres means it's unlikely she would have survived. Oh, gosh. Why would you leave on such a morbid note? Sorry. Oh. Good job. 
<laughs> All right, so next week we're doing the latest on secure jobs. Yeah, all the new changes to the laws. All right. Okay, thank you very thank much you. for watching. See you, you later. Bye-bye.